verses from chapter 2. And I want to start Judges chapter 1, and we're going to be laying a foundation this morning for a study that we will be in for the next eight weeks or so. Judges chapter 1, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Amen. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Judges chapter 1. Look at verse 1. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me unto my lot, that we might fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went up with him, and Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew of them in Besek 10,000 men. Now look with me, if you would, please, over at verse 27. First look at verse 19. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. And the children of Benjamin, verse 21, did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. Look at verse 27. Neither did the Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean. Verse 28. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Verse 31. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Achor. Verse 33. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Are you seeing a pattern here? Now, Judges chapter 2. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and I brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of the place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. Now, a couple more verses. Verse 11 of Judges 2. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered into the hands of the spoilers and spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Verse 16, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Let's start right there. May the Lord's rich blessing be to his word and may it be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, for the of your word gives light, and we pray that you might speak to us, that we might behold a good word from your law. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we're going to begin a study in this Old Testament book of Judges, and I think it's a fitting place for us to go in light of our recent study in the book of Ephesians, and we concluded last week in Ephesians dealing with this spiritual wrestling match in which we engaged. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, 
against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And so now we're going to go to the Old Testament and we're going to see how this actually occurred in the lives of the ancient Israeli people and they were fighting physical foes, but their physical foes actually were motivated and energized by those demonic spirits. Now, for the first thing we need to do is set a context to understand the historical setting of the Old Testament book of Judges. Now, you Bible scholars, you know the story of the Jewish people, how they ended up slaves in Egypt after Jacob and his family went down to Egypt to find bread. And they went in as the invited guest of Pharaoh because Joseph, Jacob's next to youngest son, had become the prime minister. But after Pharaoh died, another Pharaoh rose who did not know Joseph, who did not remember Joseph's work for the king, and the Jewish people were put in slavery or servitude. It was more like 265 years of slavery, 135 years they were free people, but a total of over 400 years they spent in Egypt. Then God sent a man by the name of Moses to provide them deliverance, and Moses brought them up out of the promised land to the very brink, the threshold out of Egypt to the threshold of the promised land. But because they didn't have the faith to go in and take the land, God cursed them, and the adults, those 20 years and older, they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, and the adult generation died off. Then God took a man by the name of Joshua, and he led, Joshua led the Israeli people into the promised land to take control or to occupy the land. This is what Joshua didn't do and what God didn't do through Joshua. What he did not do is that he did not allow Joshua to totally subdue the land. Each of the 12 tribes went in, each of the tribes occupied their territory, their space, but God allowed some of the indigenous people that were there, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Termites, and all the other ites. He left some of these indigenous people there in the land, and we will see why he did that, why he left them there. And there were lessons that he wanted to teach the people, and they needed to have some struggle. You see, these people who were coming into the land, their fathers had actually fought the battles. And they had been children. They had sort of been spectators. Very few of them had engaged in any real battle, any real conflict. And so God wanted them to have to experience some difficulty and some hardship for themselves because if they didn't experience some hardship, if they didn't learn how to fight, how were they going to be a national entity? As a nation, they were going to have to fill a military, and they were going to have to defend themselves from those nations that were around them. So God wanted these children of these warriors to taste some battle so that they would be battle-ready and battle-tested. But they didn't want no part of that. Then Judges chapter 2, verse 7, look at what it says. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Then Joshua, the son, of, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, been 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnathrace, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaash. And so all the generations were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose, what? another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So here's the problem. Joshua dies, and all of those of Joshua's generation die, those who have been warriors, those who had waged a good fight, those who had went into the land, and they died, and then their, their children now on the scene, a whole other generation. And they didn't know nothing about Joshua's battles. And they didn't know anything about the good hand of God on the nation of Israel. He says they didn't know anything about that. And that's why it's so important that as spiritual leaders, as parents, as adults, that we rehearse to the children of the next generation the great work of God. That's why on Jan June the 19th we're going to have a special Memorial Day because there are people who have founded this church 26 years ago, who gone on to be with the Lord, who sacrificed, who did without stuff so they could buy that building on Washington Street East, who sacrificed, who served, but most folk who are in this church today don't even know their names. 
Don't you know who those people are? And now we're sitting in padded pews in an air-conditioned facility with more enough room where we could not speak to each other for a week if we didn't want to, but we don't know the sacrifice of those that went before us, and we don't know the shoulders upon which we stand. And one of the marks of human degeneracy is forgetfulness. One of the marks of human degeneracy and human sin is forgetfulness, that we are quick to forget God's good hand of mercy and God's hand of provision of, from yesterday. As a matter of fact, we still got food that's still in our digestive system from yesterday. And we haven't thanked God for yesterday's food yet, and we won't know what is God going to do for us today. And so another generation rose. They didn't know nothing about Joshua, and they knew nothing about the works that God had done through Joshua and through the people. And so now they are, they are in a place, and they are experiencing a blessing, and they have an inheritance that they don't even know how it came about. So that's sort of a backdrop. Now, the book of Joshua, it takes place somewhere around 1,000 to 1050 B.C., or 1050 B.C. to 1,000 B.C., because you're going in reverse order when you're coming from B.C. 1050 to 1,000, somewhere in that time frame that the book was written. And it covers about a 200-year period, a 200-year period from the time uh, that Joshua died until the time of the monarchy in its greatest period. And so when they move into the land, they're sort of a loose confederacy. They're really not a nation yet. They're a group of 12 tribes, someone loosely knit together. They don't really have a constitution, even though they have the law that God had given to Moses, but they uh, uh, really don't have all of the infrastructure for a national entity. And so there in chapter 1, they cry out to the Lord, and they say, now we know that we still got some battles to fight, and we want to know who should go first. And so the Lord says, send Judah first. And so Judah says to his brother Simeon, the head of the tribe of Judah says to the head of the tribe of Simeon, come and go up with me that we might subdue the land. And so Simeon goes along and the Lord gives them a great victory. You can read that there in Judges chapter 5 down through uh, almost the rest of that chapter. And they have a great victory. And God has told them to go, I'm, I'm going to give it to you. It's in your hand. They have a great victory. Well, something happens. In verse 19, which we read in your hearing, Judah comes up to a place uh, of Hebron. Uh, and the Lord said unto Judah, verse 19, drive out the habitants of the mountains. But he could not drive them out because the, drive the inhabitants out of the valley because they had chariots of iron. So here becomes a problem. They encounter their first real resistance in the land. And they run these people in the valley of Gaza, and they have the most sophisticated military equipment of the day. They have chariots that have wheels on, of iron, and so they are formidable foe. And so since these people put up strong opposition and strong resistance, then they abandon the plan to drive them out because it's hard. And that's the way it always is with God's work. Easy is not an option. There's going to be resistance to doing God's work. Sometimes it's the apathy that is inside of me, overcoming my own apathy, my own uh, lethargy, and my own laziness to do what I ought to do. Sometimes it's the resistance that's put up by the enemy, the opposition. Some things are just hard to do. Some work is just hard. It just requires heavy lifting, you see. And so we are quick to abort the plan just because there's opposition and resistance. And so that's what happened to Judah because the people in, the, the, in Gaza, they put up resistance and they said, well, it must not be God's will for us to drive these people out. And so Judah <clears throat> establishes the precedent. Here's how you deal with opposition. You strike a compromise. And so the rest of the tribes, looking at the fearless leader, the tribe of Judah, and they decide, well, since Judah didn't drive out the inhabitants that he had to drive out, then we want to drive out the inhabitants that we should have to drive out. So the first mistake they made is the mistake of compromise. They compromised. God had given them a 
clear commandments. They had requested from God through a concise question, who's going to go up? God gave them a clear commandment of what to do, and so the first time they run into opposition, they compromise. Now watch what happens. In chapter 2. And so God allows them to strike this compromise. God does not force them not to strike a compromise. Look at verse uh, 28 of chapter 1. It says, And it came to pass when Israel was strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute and did, utterly, and did not utterly drive them out. Look at what they do. What they decide is, it's too hard to drive them out. But here's what we can do. Let's strike a compromise, and let's put them in some form of indentured servitude where they got to pay taxes to us. Therefore, we can generate revenue through the exploitation of their labor, and we don't have to work as hard. We won't have to work as hard because we have these indigenous people and they already are in the land and they've been farming the land and they know the lay of the land and so they can work and so we can kick back and we can be at ease. That is always a dangerous situation for the people of God to think that serving God is ever going to be easy and to think that God wants for us to be in a position of comfort and convenience. And so if they would have did what God told them to do, two things would have happened. Number one, they would have developed the spiritual stamina and the spiritual courage and the spiritual confidence that they needed. They would have filled a military. They would have had some scrimmages as an army, and they would have felt pretty good about themselves to defend themselves against the opposition, number one. Secondly, they would have developed the skills that they needed, the skills that they needed to manage the agriculture, the skills that they needed to build the economy. You see. Booker T. Washington was right when he says that one of the keys for, a, for an impressed people or for a disenfranchised people is to make themselves indispensable in the economy. And so what Booker T. says, what a people have to do that's on the Lord's rung of the socioeconomic ladder, they must master the skills that are necessary for the success of the economy. If they master those skills, then they become indispensable to the success of the economy, and over time, the economic structure has to make way for them. Now, how do you spend that? Well, if you look at Booker T. Washington did, and what he did, he started a school or expands a school to teach young people about agriculture. Because at that time in America, the farm agrarian economy was one of the major underpinnings of the economy and to teach them the skills that were needed to build the economy. The way that transfers in the 21st century, we gotta get our young people to really understand what is the economy doing, what are the skills that really drive what's the underpinning of the economic system. You master those skills, and in so mastering those skills, you become indispensable to the system. And not only that, you now have the skills necessary to create an infrastructure in your own community so that your own community can thrive and that your own community is creating employment opportunities for its people. This simple principle is right here in the text. Instead, what they did, they chose to outsource the skills that were needed to build their economy. And they allowed someone else to have the skills and to match the skills that they themselves should have had. And instead of being the masters, they end up being the servants. Because those people that they put in servitude, they had all the skills. But even more importantly, they had disobeyed what God had told them to do. Are you following? <laughs> now in Judges, what you're going to find in Judges, there are seven cycles in Judges. Seven cycles, and they all follow the same pattern. God will bless them. They will have a brief period of obedience, and God will bless them abundantly, and they will rejoice in God's blessing. And after they've been blessed for a while, they just can't stand it, and they will defect. They will sin, and they will fall into sin. 
And when they fall into sin, they will fall into oppression. And God will allow the people to oppress them. And they will be in oppression. And then they will cry out and plead and beg with God to deliver them from the oppression. God is a merciful God, a tenderhearted God. God will hear their cry, and God will send them a deliverer. And the deliverer will deliver them. And they will rejoice in their deliverance, and they will repent. And so God will bless them again. And then the cycle will continue. And the cycle continues seven times in the book of Judges. And when you come to the end of the book of Judges, the text says there was no king in Israel. So everybody did what was right in his own eyes. There was no seat of authority in the land. So everybody did what they thought was right. And over time, they spiraled out of control into gross idolatry and immorality. And so here's where we are this morning as we're setting uh, our foundation for the entire study. And so we see that they have been blessed by the Lord. They disobey God. They disobey him. They do not follow God's prescription. They do not follow God's recipe. They do not execute God's plan because what God wanted to do is he wanted to show up. When Judah went into Gaza, God wanted to show them that even the most sophisticated weapons of warfare of their day could not stand against God's army when they were energized by the Holy Spirit. And that would give them even great confidence and their faith would be strengthened. And so their, for their disobedience caused a forfeiture of a blessing to where God would show up on their behalf. But disobedience won't just rest at disobeying. There was a, a progression a downward spell that will continue. Now look at what the text says again, and we're going to close our thoughts this morning. Verse 11, which I read in your hearing of chapter 2. There was disobedience, and now there comes defection. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Balaam, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger and they forsook the Lord their God and they served Baal and Ashtaroth and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered into the hands of the spoilers and they spoiled them and he sold them into the hands of their enemies around about them so they could not any longer stand before the enemies with the servant they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil as the Lord had said, as the Lord had sworn unto them and they were greatly distressed disobedience progressed to defection. And here's what you'll always find among religious folk is that if the religion is pure, if the religion is true and honoring to God, then that religion would put restraints upon the people and it will help the people to control their desires and their passions. But if the religion becomes polluted or perverted, the first thing you will see is that they will throw off restraint, they will throw off the control of passion, and natural desires will then spiral out of control. Now watch this. They first disobeyed God, so the first thing you have to do is that you have to lay aside the Word of God. You have to disregard the Word of God. And now that leads to 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 the de defection because they're still religious and what they're saying is we know that we are religious and we know that we need a religion but we just don't want the religion that put constraints on us. Are you following? So what they did, they looked around the people that were around about them. They said, well, these people got a good religion. They got good music. Their religion is energetic. Their religion has passion. Their religion has zeal to it. They got good religion, and this religion has served them well because, look, this land that they're living in, look, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. If that religion is good enough for them, it's good enough for us. So they disobey, they defect, and then they discard the religion, and they embrace the religious system that surrounds them. Now, here's what happened. The people of the land had a systematic religious system. As a matter of fact, their religious system was older than Judaism. The worship of Baal and Ashtaroth. And these were, were, were uh, pagan gods, idolatrous gods, and the worship of, of Baal actually involved the sacrifice of children. 
there were human sacrifices offered to Baal, and often it was the children that were sacrificed to Baal, and that was a showing of a devotion to their God. But in sacrificing their children, what that also did, it enabled them to eliminate a burden that caused them to have to exercise some type of discipline. Listen to what I'm saying. If I got children that I got to provide for, I got to cook for, clean for, I got to work for, then those, the, the children that I have, they put some restraint upon the way I live if I'm going to be a responsible parent. However, if I can get rid of my children, then I can live the way I want to live. So the religion said you can get rid of your children so that you can serve God the way you want to serve him. So they sacrificed their children. Now, don't look at me strange, because children have been sacrificed on the altar of pleasure every single day. We've got a huge problem of child abuse and child neglect. We have a, a system, a foster care system that's totally overcrowded. We've got hundreds of children that even from West Virginia are outside of the state because they've been abused by their parents. Parents are offering their children up on the altar so they can indulge themselves in their own sinful pleasure. You see, I know what I'm talking about because I don't live in this sanctified, sanitized world. I deal with these issues every single day. Mothers who are addicted to drugs, who can't take care of their children, children who are offending for themselves, children who are being abused sexually, children who are being neglected, children are being offered up on the altar of sacrifice in our society today, and the church, by and large, is silent. By and large, the church is silent and is not pleading the case of the poor and the oppressed. James says in James chapter 1, real religion, pure religion, a religion that's undefiled and uncorrupted, it, it visits the widows and the orphans in their affliction. And it keeps oneself unspotted from the world. And so we have embraced a religious system that allows for children to be mistreated and abused, and there's no real outcry from those who say that they are the people of God. And then there was Ashtaroth. And Ashtaroth was the god of, of sexual pleasure. And just like in Ephesus, where there was Artemis, or the goddess Diana, where they had the temple prostitutes, both male and female, Ashtaroth was the god of sexual pleasure. And so Ashtaroth promoted sexual perversion because the worship of Ashtaroth said when you experience sexual orgasm and sexual ecstasy, then you are, you are entering into a deeper communion and fellowship with the gods. A perverted system. A downward spiral. Now, nobody wants to talk about this today in our society. But the, our problem is, if you read the text carefully, what the Bible says is that because they disobeyed and because they defected and because they discarded their religion, God let them do it. And the Bible says, and the anger of the Lord was against them. And he caused the hands of the spoilers to spoil them. In other words, God allowed their choices, he allowed their decisions, and the consequences of their choices to be their discipline and their chastisement. Well, I got to wrap this thing up. Here is the application for us today. The major problem that we face in this community, this county, this state, and even this nation, the major problems that we face is a, it is a problem of disobedience to the word of God, defection from the ways of God, a discarding of the standards of God, which results in a degeneracy that manifests itself with immorality. And so what is strangling the life out of the community? What's strangling the life out of the community is immorality. It is immorality. It is the pursuit of pleasure. It is the pursuit of ecstasy. People pollute their minds and their bodies with drugs because they don't want to deal with the real problems of life. And so they run into a situation where there's an enemy that has iron weapons of warfare and they don't want to fight. If anything is hard, then I'm going to escape. And then we see this pollution of our society with sexual perversion. 
And so young people's minds at a very early age is overexposed. It becomes bent and twisted. And so young people are overstimulated far too early and having experiences far too early. And so sex becomes really the pursuit. And sexual fulfillment becomes the pursuit of so many people. And though in and in, in that, it becomes the oppressor. And it becomes the oppressor, and it gives the enemy the foothold that he needs in people's lives, in an area where there is a natural desire, but it becomes perverted, and it becomes distorted, and now it becomes a source of oppression rather than a source of a blessing. This is uncomfortable for folk. But this is the truth, and that's what's wrong. We're not dealing with the truth. And we're not challenging people to understand what we're dealing with in our society today. And so we're looking for solutions that just simply will not work. This disobedience and this defection and this degeneracy and this downward spiral has now created an oppression because the enemy now has a foothold to oppress the people. Well, I'm not going to leave you hanging right there, though. Because I see verse 16. Verse 15 says, Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. But I like that conjunction, nevertheless, as the text says. It says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judgment. Now I'm going to hit this and I'm going to quit. The term judges is misleading because when we think of a judge, we think of a man or a woman who wears a black robe, comes out of an office in the back, everybody stand up, they take their seat at the bench, and then they talk real mean to everybody and tell folk what they're supposed to do. Now, this word judge is translated from the Hebrew word shoptim, S-H-O-P-T-I-M, shoptim. And shoptim would have been better translated a deliverer or even better translated a champ. What the text is saying is that even in the midst of their defection and their disobedience, their degeneracy, their downward spiral, and their distress, God saw their situation, and God reached down from among them, and God tapped somebody on the shoulder that was right in the middle of all the mess, and God raised up a champion right out of the mess. And the champions emerged on the scene right out of the mess, Because the champions, they feel the pain of the people. The champions understand the pathology of the people. The champions understand the pressure that they're under. And so God taps the champion on the shoulder, and he raises the champions up from among the people to provide deliverance for the people and direction for the people and vision for the people and hope for the people and call the people to repentance toward God. So the question is, in our society today, The question is, in the midst of the cesspool of sin in which we're dealing with, the question today, is the church merely going to be an oasis? Is it going to be a little sanctified place that separates itself from everything that's going on? Are the people of God going to respond to God's call and be God's champions for the day? The people need champions. The people need deliverers. They need people who understand the distress that they are in, but know how to help them get out of it. And who, who, who creates a clear moral vision of what it means to repent and put one faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and it creates a model of how people can break the cycle of dysfunction and the cycle of perversion. Are you following? And the church becomes this new community in the midst of a cesspool of sin. God raises up champions in and from the people of God, and those champions are able to reach out to folk. Now, everybody's not going to be saved. I don't care how hard you work and how hard you pray and how much you give and how much you sacrifice. Some people just don't want to serve God. They love sin, and they want to keep on doing it. But there are some folk, they'll grab hold to the lifeline. They'll grab hold to the lifeline because they want a better life. We're God's champions. We're going to see in this study some obscure people that we never talk about. 
but it had not been for them responding to God's call. But it wouldn't have been a nation of Israel. <laughs> the nation wouldn't have survived. God still works through people. God still works through individuals who look at a situation and say it might be difficult, but God is still God. And nothing is too hard for him. And God can turn that situation around. Nevertheless, God raised up Jesse to bring deliverance to the people. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word.